Well, thank you everyone for joining us today on the Property Buyer webinar. My name is Rich Harvey, CEO and founder of propertybuyer.com.au and today with me is Natalia Clack. Thank you so much, Natalia, for joining us today. Thank you, Rich. Thanks for inviting me. So just to introduce Natalia, uh, she is a self-managed super fund guru. She's not only an accountant and an auditor, but also an advisor in self-managed super funds. And this year has also won two awards uh, for SMF Advisor of the Year. So well done to you, Natalia. Now, Natalia, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. But just a quick couple of housekeeping things, everybody. Uh, if you have a question during the webinar, please just write it into the Q&A box down below. Uh, we will be providing a full recording of this webinar and also the slide notes will be emailing to you uh, later today or first thing in the morning after they're all completed. So don't stress about taking too many notes, but do, um, yeah, please hit us with your questions. We will have a good, good amount of time after the two presentations. Um, I'm going to be covering off around property types and property strategies, and Natalia will be talking about, does it make sense to buy a property in a self-managed super fund? So Natalia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, again. So let me just share my slides. Uh, all right. I'm excited today to talk about this topic. This is something where I'm very passionate about. Mm. Right. Buying property in SMSF, does it make sense? Let's have a look. Um, first of all, is disclaimer, because I'm a SMSF advisor as well. I've got a, I'm a forest representative with a limited license. So my disclaimer is that information which I'm providing you with, uh, with today is a general information only, as I didn't consider your personal circumstances, objectives, and needs. Right, so housekeeping, uh, like Rich said, I already mentioned about it, all the questions we will answer uh, in the end of the presentations. Uh, all right, so I've been doing SMSFs for 20 years since um, I landed in Australia 20 years ago. If you're wondering where my accent is from, uh, I'm from Russia originally. I still have a strong accent. Uh, however, I have a lot of information and a lot of knowledge to share with you. So I, um, yeah, I want a couple of awards this year, which I'm very proud about because it just shows that, uh, you know, like all my uh, knowledge, all my 20 years of experience, it's been, it's been noticed uh, and acknowledged. All right, what is SMSF? Let's start with uh, SMSF, what it is. We start with the basics and we move uh, to more complicated stuff. All right, what is SMSF? SMSF is a special trust. And uh, because it's a trust, it has to have a trustee. Uh, it could be a corporate trustee, which is a PTY LTD. It, uh, it's a special trustee company or individual trustees. Must be at least two trustees to become the individual trustees for SMSF. SMSF can have up to six members. Used to be four, but it's changed to six. And um, all the members, they must be the trustees for SMSF or they must be directors of the corporate trustee for SMSF. So, and they cannot employ each other. So it could not be a relationship like uh, employee and employer unless people are related. So if husband and wife, they can have SMSF and if they employ each other, it's okay. So, all right. So what are the rules for SMSF? So SMSF is a uh, special entity, special trust, and it's ruled by CISAC, Superannuation Industry Supervision Act, 1993 and Superannuation Industry Supervision Regulation, CISR, this is how we call it, uh, short, 1994. Also, of course, Income Tax Act, and um, this is uh, what the government's uh, regulations are. And on the fund level, we have a trustee. When you establish your SMSF, SMSF will have governing rules, which, which are entrusted, and we have investment strategy. Investment strategy is responsibility of a trustees of a, for SMSF. So trustees must uh, formulate, implement, and regularly review the investment strategy. So it's your decision, basically, where you want to invest your superannuation. So why we, why we are talking about SMSF? Why it's such an attractive option? for a lot of people. So, of course, uh, most of us will have some superannuation, especially if you've been uh, legally employed, you'll have superannuation. If you are self-employed, technically you should pay yourself superannuation as well. So 
all of us should have some superannuation. But why why self-managed superannuation fund? Why don't keep superannuation in the industry or retail superannuation fund? So first of all, um, when I ask my clients this question, they say, we want to control. We want to control our money. We want to make decisions about where to invest. We want to... We want to invest in the assets of our choice, of our preferences, and this is the attractive option, uh, which is SMSF, because you cannot make a decision in the industry or retail superannuation fund. You cannot tell the fund managers, oh, I want to invest in such and such shares or such and such assets. You cannot, for example, uh, invest in property. You can invest in property funds uh, with your superannuation in the industry fund, but you cannot invest in a property, direct property. Uh, estate planning, estate planning uh, could be done more tailored in a self-managed superannuation fund rather than when you superannuation in a large superannuation fund. And uh, taxation, of course. When we talk about SMSF, we are talking about the tax haven literally in Australia, because as you know, uh, Australians, we pay a lot of taxes and the highest uh, marginal tax rate is a 45% plus Medicare. So in the SMSF, when we look at the tax, we look at maximum you pay is 15%. So 15% tax you pay on, a, on the income or on the capital gain. However, with the capital gain, there is a discount. Uh, not as generous as 50%, but it's 33.333%. Uh, so basically, if you hold the asset, the assets for more than 12 months, uh, there is a discount applied and you pay only 10% tax. So 15%, then it goes to 10%, and then it even can go to 0%. So when you retire uh, and you have a self-managed superannuation fund, you can pay 0% tax. What you need to do, you just need to transfer your uh, SMSF from so-called accumulated stage to the pension stage. So when I talk about retirement, I'm talking about retirement for superannuation purposes, which is you have to reach the age of 65, just reach the age of 65, that's it. And you can technically move to the 0% tax in SMSF, or you have to reach uh, the age of 60 and retire from one of the uh, employment. So you have to quit. Say if you have two jobs, you can quit only one job. If you have one job, you have to quit your uh, job uh, when you reach the age of 60. So one of those uh, cases, and you can uh, move your SMSF into the uh, pension phase, which means 0% tax on the income, 0% ta tax on the um on the capital gain. What it means, if you, have, for example, uh, buy the assets, say you buy property now, you're say 40, you hold this property until 60, you retire, you sell the property, whatever you make, zero capital gain tax. And also when you take a pension from a SMSF, this is the, the other thing where you don't pay any tax. This is why SMSF is a tax haven. When you take a pension from a SMSF, your pension income doesn't go doesn't go to individual tax return. It doesn't get taxed ever. So you're paying less, uh, zero tax on income and you're taking money with, with uh, paying zero tax as well. All right, but the SMSF is not for everyone. So have to give this information, provide this information as well. Why SMSF could not be a good idea? Uh, first of all, it's a minimum balance. So sometimes uh, sometimes people call to me and they say, oh, can I set up a SMSF with 50, we have 50,000 in in a superannuation, you have to think. You have to think about uh, if you're paying fees because SMSF is a trust. So SMSF needs to lodge uh, annual tax return, and also uh, the financials of SMSF they must be audited by the independent auditor every year. So what it means, you will incur fees. You will incur accounting fees, audit fees, ASIC fees, and ATO fees. So the fees will be say between three and four thousand on average. Uh, if you have 50 grand in the SMSF and it's hard to make, uh, it's hard to make the income enough to cover your fees. And plus, obviously, you want your superannuation balance to grow. So you have to consider the minimum balance. ASIC used to have a requirement of 200,000 um, to start the SMSF. 
Then they increase it to 500,000. But uh, fortunately, they dropped the 500,000 and 200,000 completely. However, you still have to make your, um, you, you still have to uh, think and calculate how much you're planning to make, what's your uh, calculations and how much the expenses will be. Can um, I just ask Natalia, just on yeah. that, what would you as a rule of thumb without giving advice, what would you suggest yeah. is a kind of minimum oh, balance these yeah, days? Yeah, at, le at least 150 at least 150 to yeah, make, right. yeah, yeah, sensible, so. Okay. Um, all right, complicated rules. Obviously, there are a lot of rules. Like I said, CIS Act, uh, six, six, uh, CIS regulations, but again, which is why you need the professional, which is why like people like myself, we've been doing only SMSS because you cannot know it all. You cannot do uh, all the type of uh, taxes and entities and know deep uh, about every single uh, different type of entities. So SMSFs are complicated and uh, which is why you need to basically have someone who can guide you uh, along your journey uh, with superannuation. Uh, more expensive to run, again, this is when we talk about the balance. Um, when you have your money in the industry or retail superannuation fund, there are two types of fees, administration fees and investment fees. Administration fees, they stay the same. They're not that high, like $60, $70 per year. However, the investment fees, they, they are percentage of the superannuation balance. So what it means, it means your balance goes up, your fees go, uh, go up as well. However, in the SMSF, the fees stay the same. Doesn't matter if you have 200,000 or $2 million. It's all about uh, how complicated your investments are. So the fees will stay the same. So what it means, it means that fees in the SMSF will become approximately the same at 200 grand, 250,000 compared to the industry or retail superannuation fund. And then uh, running the SMSF will become cheaper after approximately like three, uh, 300,000 uh, uh, benchmark. So, which is why I'm saying could be more expensive to run. Time, time consuming to manage, of course, because you have to make decisions, you have to decide where to invest, you have to basically spend time uh, keeping the records and yeah, so time, you need to have time as well. Uh, Financial knowledge required, again, you need to understand uh, your decisions, you need to understand where you're investing, or you need to uh, find the right professional, for example, uh, such as the rich, for example, if you want to buy a property, you don't have to do it yourself, you can always engage the professionals who've been doing it for uh, many, many years. Um, investment losses, if you lose, um, it's, your, it's your loss, it's too bad. Uh, trustee responsibility. So basically, uh, as a trustee, you will be responsible for running your SMSF. So you will be um, signing a trustee declaration where you confirm that you're responsible. And potentially, if you breach the law, if you breach the CIS Act, CIS regulations, the ATO penalties will apply. The ATO penalties, they are um, 313 uh, it's a penalty unit, and usually one uh, one breach would be 60 penalty units. So we are talking about 19 grand for the breach. So which is why again you need a professional <laughs> to to help you with your uh, with running your SMSF. So all right, what assets uh, SMSFs can invest into? Of course, you can invest in cash, term deposits. Um, you know, like conservatively, you can invest in uh, shares in uh, Australia, uh, in uh, overseas, uh, listed, unlisted, unit trusts, listed, unlisted, managed funds. Of course, all these investments are allowed. Uh, you can invest in property, which we are going to talk more, uh, commercial or residential property. You can invest in uh, precious metals, such as uh, mm -hmm. silver, gold, and you can invest in collectibles, which is not very popular at the moment. And we wouldn't advise you because it's it's quite a complicated investment. So yeah, all range, uh, range of uh, assets and cryptocurrency, I think I mentioned as well. So becoming quite a popular one. All right, well, what property works for SMSF? So when we talk about the property, we talk about commercial, which is, the, is, like, which is a business real property or residential. 
a residential we know is like the where property where you can put a tenant in rent it out uh, commercial is you need the business uh, you rent it out to the business obviously you can invest in land there is no nothing prohibits you to invest your superannuation in just land um there are there are some considerations of course because you need to the sole purpose of superannuation is providing benefits for retirement so if you invest in land and land is not doing anything it's not providing you the income and it's not uh growing in, in 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 value then you have to think is it uh, is it right for my smsf airbnb very often i've been asked uh can i invest in airbnb yes you can uh and more so basically almost um uh, whatever you might think about the property you can do but of course there are limitations and which we'll talk later on uh, as well so how to buy a property in a smsf obviously um if you want to buy property in a self-managed superannuation fund, it has to be, you have to buy it with superannuation money and it has to be under SMSF name as well. One of the main rules for SMSFs is that the uh, money of self-managed superannuation fund, uh, all the assets, all the cash, they have to be kept separately from your own assets. It means SMSF has to have its own uh, bank account uh, with SMSF name on it and the property or whichever other assets you buy in SMSF, they must be under SMSF name as well. So, all right, so you can buy property up front. It's the easiest uh, way. Um, unfortunately, not always um, available when you just go and buy property for five, six, seven, whatever, 100,000, million, but you have to have this cash in SMSF. You can borrow. SMSFs are prohibited, general rule, SMSFs are prohibited from borrowing. And only one uh, exemption, a couple of exemptions, but for uh, our purpose, we are talking about one exemption, which is a limited recourse borrowing arrangement. It's a special arrangement, um, which is um, only arrangement allowed SMSF to borrow. Uh, it's a limited recourse. It's called limited recourse because if you fail your repayments, um, the bank, the lender can only go after this particular property. They cannot go after any other assets in SMSF or they cannot go after any um, of your personal assets. So, and there is a special entity which needs to be set up. It's a little bit technical, but again, um, it's not you who are going to set it up. There are professionals who, who do it for you. The entity is called uh, Bear Trust and Bear Trust is set up to protect this property from um, from the creditors because bear trust will be holding the property until the loan is repaid. So you can buy um, you can buy property with related party. You can buy with other SMSFs. You can buy um, basically the tenants in common in common with any other uh, party you might think of. Um, and there are last way of buying property is unlisted union trust. Again, there are a lot of options. Um, how unlisted unit trust could be structured. There are limitations. Again, we are not going to talk about it today because it's going too, too deep, um, too complicated. All right, let's talk about the SMSF borrowing. Uh, like I mentioned before, Section 67 prohibits SMSF from borrowing. The only exemption is a limited recourse borrowing arrangement, and we need to establish the bear trust. When we are talking about limited recourse borrowing arrangements, there are limitations, unfortunately, again, but government set these limitations up so people cannot just um, borrow and do whatever, you know, like they want to do. They decided, okay, we want to limit uh, people uh, from doing certain things, such as property development, for example. All right, so it has to be single acquirable asset. So, for example, if... Um, if you have apartment with um with a car park and they sold even that there are separate titles because usually single acquirable asset means one title but if you have something which is sold typically together it still will be covered uh, it still will be considered to be single acquirable asset for the purpose of limited recourse borrowing arrangement my example apartment plus the car, uh, car park because it comes together. It's actually sold together. Um, asset is held in a trust. So uh, Bear Trust will be holding this property, holding this asset until 
SMSF repays the loan. So SMSF is responsible for repaying the loan, but uh, Bayer Trust is um, is the owner of, 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 of this property until it's repaid. Um, all right, borrowing trust meets the CIS requirements. This is what I said. It's about uh, technicality of it. Again, um, don't think about it too much because it's all done by the professionals. SMSF trustee is a beneficiary of this trust. So if something happens, um, so it, you know, if you repay the, the loan, uh, the property will go back to SMSF as an owner. So you don't need to pay the stamp duty because the property could be transferred from the bear trust to SMSF, and because it's the same beneficiary, which is SMSF, no stamp duty is payable. It's a limited recourse. Recourse is limited to the particular property. Uh, it's actually, this is the reason why the interest rate are uh, usually a little bit higher for limited recourse borrowing arrangement because the banks consider um, this arrangement to be risky or riskier. Uh, but I've never seen uh, anyone failed, to be honest, uh, repayments. Um, acquiring is not prohibited under CSAC. So basically, whatever you can buy with cash, it's exactly the same rules ap apply uh, when you do a limited recourse borrowing arrangement and you borrow from the bank. Only new replacement asset is allowed. What it means, it means if you already have property in a SMSF uh, and you uh, you paid for it, so you cannot go and um, refinance this property. So it has to be new property which you are buying, not new in terms of being a new property, but new for SMSF. So, um, all right, a sale contract signed by custodian. Again, it's a little bit of technicality here, but SMSF is responsible for the loan repayments. Um, deposit has to be made from SMSF bank account. This is when we say that. Whatever SMSF, um, whatever belongs to SMSF must be on the SMSF name. All the income has to go back to SMSF. All the expenses must be paid from SMSF bank account as well. So it's a completely separate entity. And think about it as um, you are a manager of this entity, of this money until, uh, until you retire and can enjoy it. So uh, no redraw facility added after, like I said, everything is set up at the moment of the borrowing um, and loan could be refinanced again uh, after, for example, if you find the uh, lender who offers the better conditions, but usually in SMSF, from my experience, not a lot of people refinancing very often just because it's like um, quite a complicated uh, exercise and uh, yeah. Uh, all right, this is how it works. You have SMSF, you have a bear trust, um, set up, you have this property, Bear Trust is holding the property. Uh, lender, of course, they do have a security over the property. Beneficial uh, ownership belongs to SMSF. Uh, SMSF pays uh, to the bank and rent goes back to SMSF. So basically, Bear Trust doesn't have a bank account, doesn't have ABN, doesn't have TFN. It's a see-through entity, fewer holding this property until this guy gets uh, his money. Okay, what can you do with property in SMSF? So you can do a property development, but uh, if you don't have any borrowings. So if you don't have limited recourse borrowing arrangement, you can do property development. You buy property with SMSF money, with superannuation money, you develop it, you subdivide, do whatever you wanna do to make money uh, with cash. Cash is a kink uh, in the SMSS as well. Um, you can rent it to unrelated party. Uh, again, residential or commercial, you you know you you want to rent it out. You want to get you, you want to get the money. In, you want to get the income in. Um, you can rent it to related party only business if it's a business real property. What it means again, very uh, very uh, often I get this question: Can I buy a property? Uh, investment property like a unit and live in it? No, you cannot live in it. Uh, can your uh, children live in it? No. Your relatives? No. <laughs> None of the related party, uh, including your actually business partners, they are a related party, um, can live in this property. Even if you charge them rent, residential property could only be uh, uh, rented out to unrelated party. 
very important. Business real property is different. You can buy um, business, sorry, you can buy business real property in the SMSF with a SMSF money and rent it back to your business. No problem. As long as it's um, at market rate, commercial arm's length arrangement, uh, it could be done. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with residential property. So cannot live in it. Um, however, however, when um, when you reach this golden age of retirement, which I already said, it's the age of 65 or age of 60 and retire, then you can think of uh, moving property out of SMSF um, as a lump sum in specie payment to yourself. And then you can live in it. Uh, but you have to wait until you obviously reach this happy, happy age. Um, what can you do if property under limited recourse borrowing arrangement? Because, um, of course, it's nice to have cash, hundred percent cash, and you go and pay. But what can you do? You can, uh, if you don't, if you don't have cash, and you have to borrow, you can borrow uh, for maintenance and repairs. So when you buy property, say if a property needs some maintenance and repairs, you can borrow, you can include it in a loan in the first place. Um, you can do improvements, however, not if you're borrowing money. So what improvements means, and this is like, again, it's very technical, but um, repair and maintenance, repairs when someone's something's broken, obviously you have to repair maintenance is uh, when something is going to get broken and you need to maintain it in the working condition. So it's completely different from improvements. Improvements when you want to uh, improve the existing conditions of, of, of the house or of the property. So repairs and maintenance would be done with borrowed money. Improvements could be done only with our uh, own cash, SMSF cash, I mean. So what it means, it means if you want to do some improvements in the property with the property, you need to have a cash in the SMSF after you borrow. And uh, however, um, no improvements or property development could be done with the borrowing. So improvements, um, when we talk about improvements, improvements don't change the nature of the property. For example, it was a residential property, you decided to um Build it. For example, one level, you decided to add another level, level of the property, it will be improvement which could be done with SMSF on cash. But it doesn't change the nature of the property. However, if you want to subdivide the block of land and build two townhouses, you cannot do it because it will not be improvement. It will change the nature of the property. It will make it two different titles, two different properties. So it will be development. Development, like I mentioned before, you can do if you have a cash, if if you don't have limited recourse borrowing arrangement, or you can pay it out and do the, your development. So these are examples of improvements. It's like bathroom renovation, kitchen renovation, uh, converting converting the carport to garage, building a pool. It's all improvements. So it could be done with SMSF cash. All right, now let's talk about SMSF establishment process. SMSF establishment process, it um, obviously consists of uh, two steps, important steps. First is a statement of advice, where uh, I'm as advisor, I will consider your personal circumstances, objectives, and needs. We'll look at your uh, SMSF, uh, sorry, at your superannuation, and if SMSF is the right option for you in your circumstances, in your particular circumstances, we we'll look at um, the borrowing. If you want to do limited recourse borrowing arrangement, if you want to buy a property, we have to look at your cash flow. We have to look at uh, how much you can borrow. Um, you do this exercise with the mortgage broker as well, but I need to cover it in a statement of advice as well. We also look at optimizing the contributions, minimizing the tax. Uh, we're looking at um, we look at the insurances as well. So it's a lot to consider in the statement of advice. And it's a government requirement. So it's required by the government to have this statement of advice uh, done before you set up SMSF to make sure that SMSF is in your best interest. It's not for everyone, like I said before. And second step is a trust establishment where we establish the physical trust with a corporate. Usually we recommend a corporate trust. There are reasons for it. I won't go into the details, but there are reasons. And... Um, we apply for EBNT, FAN, again, electronic service address, all the 
technicality, we basically assist with that as well. After it's all established, you can open a bank account in any of the banks which you prefer and which does have the bank which does have a, have an option to open the account for SMSS because not all banks work with SMSS. Uh, roll over the existing superannuation again. We help you with it um, and fees. Fees involved. So let's talk about fees and the um, exciting offer we have today. The fees for SMSF establishment is $7,000. Usually it covers statement of advice and establishment of the uh, SMSF with the corporate trustee. However, today we have a, a special offer, which is $2,000 discount. If we book, uh, if uh, you book a session with me in the next 30 days, um, I believe you can book it uh, going by going on uh, our website. Uh, there is a Calendly uh, booking link and you can book a session with me uh, and uh, mention this webinar that you were attendee uh, of the, on the webinar and I'll give you a discount, $2,000 discount, which is very, very good discount. So, right. So how we can help, of course, you know, like, um, I'm a SMSF advisor. So we do help with SMSF establishment with limited recourse borrowing arrangement, all the, uh, technical support. Uh, we also SMSF accountants. So we do financials and annual, uh, tax returns. I'm also a SMSF auditor, so I do the um, SMSF audits, not for my SMSF, not for my clients, uh, SMSF, but for other accountants. So I know everything from the auditor's point, point of view. So any um, technical question, any strategy question, any uh, tax advice, uh, again, around the SMSF, we all provide uh, for our clients. And... Um, Obviously, if you want to buy property, we also specialize in crypto as well. Uh, and yeah, you're welcome to book a session with me. So this is our website, www.smsfconsulting.com.au. And the, this is where you can find information how to book a session. Uh, or you can send us email inquiry at smsfconsulting.com.au or Natalia at smsfconsulting.com.au. Also, you can follow us on um, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn. I put uh, a lot of YouTube videos, like very short um, you know, videos to explain the complex things. I try to do it in a simple term, so you can find uh, videos on the different topics. But basically, yeah, that's it. Wonderful, Natalia. Look, there's some great questions coming through. Um, I can see there. So, look, that's just fantastic. And uh, I think we're up to about 18 questions. So, please keep them coming. We will be answering them in about 15 minutes or so. Um, I'm just going to uh, share my screen now, Natalia. Look, there's some great information there. I think a lot of people are, are really curious to know how it's going to work and how to set it up. So, I think, yeah, you've definitely had some good value. And there's, there's so many technicalities around it. Um, it's really important that people are aware of, of what's required so um yeah so um cool now just tell me natalia is that screen showing full screen yep yeah, perfect yeah. awesome so i'm just going to go through guys um and just share on my screen uh, a little bit about um where just the strategies that we're using for a lot of our clients both inside and outside super super i'm going to talk about some of the ideal property types that natalia has referred to and then really spend a bit of time on case studies uh, and give you a picture of how we might be able to help you in your property journey as well. So um, a lot of you know my background. I won't go through all of that there, but I can save that for the slides. I'd rather get to the questions. So let's go through some of the, um, I guess, uh, key strategies that we've got available. So one of the things I like to do if I'm buying either a property in super or outside is simply to buy an established property in a high growth area, the classic long-term capital growth strategy. And if you go back to one of my um, newsletters about two months ago, I actually analysed the average median house price in each capital city, and I extrapolated it back 25 years, and then I extrapolated it forward 25 years to look at what median house prices will be in each capital city. And it's incredibly revealing and, what's the word, motivating for me to buy more properties. Um, so in 25 years' time, Sydney's median house price will be very close to $7 million. Can you believe it? It's crazy. Um, but that's just the power of compound growth. You know, if you took 7%, between 7 and 8% is what property is typically done in every capital city, or most city, Melbourne, Brisbane at least. 
um, and holding a good quality property, you know, even accounting for inflation at two or three percent, you're still well ahead, um, and it's a great wealth building asset. So that's my number one. Obviously, positive cash flow properties very much talked about in an era right now where we've got high interest rates, where you can get an absolute dollar return in your pocket by just holding that property. Another one's adding value. <clears throat> we talked about improvements, flipping and developing. Uh, again, more risky strategy, but definitely can be done if you've got the right knowledge, the contacts and the budget. Another great one I've used frequently is adding a granny flat. Uh, we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, joint ventures in a development and obviously buying and self-managed super funds. So they're the, uh, the key strategies. What are some common mistakes that we're seeing out there um, with property investing? And I, I think, number one, a lot of people have a budget, think they've got a super fund and go, great, let's just buy anything without executing a strategy. It's really important to get the right advisors around you. You know, a good accountant, someone like Natalie, who's an SMS specialist, but also a good buyer's advocate or a strategist to help you pick the right location and then the right property. Um, a lot of people I see are driven by purely by tax deductions. You know, they sold what I call pups off the plan um, that are in terribly, you know, um, what's the word, oversupplied areas. So really stay away from the spruikers and, and I'm not a big fan of off the plan unless I know it's an absolute cracker. Um, so then you need to do a lot of research to, to do that. And actually talking of research, um, I think there's a lot of stats out there that show people spend more time planning their Christmas and Easter holidays than they do planning their property purchase. So uh, <laughs> I recommend you spend at least a couple of weeks doing research rather than just uh, putting your finger in there and guessing where to buy. Um, the other problem, I again, these are one of my problems was paralysis of analysis. When I bought my first property, I had a big fear of debt um, and I did a lot of analysis and I couldn't actually execute until I got help. So, you know, uh, when I bought my first property 25 years ago or 30 years ago, it was uh, it was a bit of a um, emotional roller coaster, but it's certainly good to get over it and understand how you think about making decisions so you can move forward. So let's talk about the sort of types of properties that might work for self-managed super funds. And again, there's a lot of options you've got. You can buy residential or you can buy commercial. On the resi side, you could buy a house, an apartment, a villa, townhouse. You could buy land, which I wouldn't recommend because it's not going to provide much return, or even a holiday house, an Airbnb. It. Um, in the commercial space, you could buy office, industrial, medical, health, or retail. Um, I'd be pretty careful of office valuations at the moment because, because of the work from home thing, they're really struggling on valuation. So a real favourite of ours for our clients is industrial, um, and Alberto and our team's doing some amazing work, um, getting some off-market deals at over six percent in the industrial space, and also medical suites are great too. Very, very consistent income, very good demand. Um, so again, again, it just comes down to when you've found the right area, make sure you pick the right property to suit that area. Make sure it's going to have consistent rental demand. That it's going to be. There's a clear exit strategy when you buy this property. One day you might want to sell it. Um, and as we've just seen, particularly if you buy a property in a self-managed super fund and then you sell it when you're age 65 or over, how much tax is there, Natalia? Zero. Zero. Did I hear right? Zero? Is that right? That's awesome. So that's one of the huge benefits of buying a property in a self-managed super fund is that zero, that zero tax rate down the track. All right, um, I'll just quickly mention what we do as buyers agents and how we provide our service. And then I want to give some case studies. So whether you use us or whether you do it on yourself or by yourself, these are the seven steps that you need to go through to make sure that you execute well. As I mentioned, number one, decide on a strategy. Is it a buy and hold? Is it a buy and add value? Is it a positive cash flow? Is it a renovation? Like decide the strategy for, and make sure it's appropriate for the area. The last thing you want to do is do a flip or a, or a reno in an area where it doesn't support the valuations uh, in that area. Um, so you need to get out there, research median prices, days on market, vacancy rates, look at all the key stats, get a real helicopter view of the market, and then decide uh, and start shortlisting some properties within that area. And it does get a bit exciting when you start to find the right properties, but you soon find that the gold comes to the top and you start to get a real feel for an area once you really get you know, shoes on the ground, boots on the ground, so to speak, in that area. Um, and it's obviously pretty difficult if you're buying, if you're living in Sydney and you're trying to buy in Melbourne or Brisbane or vice versa. Um, and that's why we've got a, a national team that can help us help you 
across the across the country. Once you've got your shortlist, then you've got to evaluate and work out what to pay. Um, I was just reading an article a moment ago about 70% of people, one of their biggest frustrations with realestate.com is the lack of transparency when it comes to pricing. Uh, people put in a price range and all these properties come up and it says contact agent. It doesn't say price. And that's a very difficult thing. So one of the things we're good at is identifying what is the price, which properties you should put on the short list and worth targeting versus those that you shouldn't. And then it comes down to doing further due diligence. So what that means is you'll do a pest and a building inspection. Uh, if it's a house, if it's a strata, if it's a unit, you do a strata inspection. You might want to check neighbouring DAs. You might want to check crime rates. You might want to check vacancy rates, uh, rental returns, all of those key things that go into underpinning whether the property you've selected is a good one to make it an A-grade investment. And then the next step is to step into the negotiating ring, get the boxing gloves on, um, and working out the best way to secure the property, whether it's a private treaty or whether it's an auction. You know, do you go in low ball? Do you offer above guide? You know, where should you position your offer? All of that dance that takes sometimes days, it can take weeks, and sometimes it can take minutes uh, if you know what you're doing. Um, and so then you've got to organise contract review with your solicitor, negotiate any special conditions and get the property exchanged. And last step is moving through to property management and settlement. So they're the, uh, the key seven steps. Why you might want to think about using a buyer's agent is really these couple of things. One is that we'll give you that strategy. Um, we'll give you access to off-market opportunities. It saves a heck of a lot of time. Most people on their own take around 12 months to buy a property when they first think about buying to when they sign a contract. Our average turnaround time for when someone engages us as a buyer's agent to when you're executing on a property is around one to two months on average depending on the time of year. Obviously, this time of year blows out a bit, but we don't rush it, but we're just very efficient at identifying opportunities. And having those local relationships, the local knowledge, that's incredibly valuable. And overall, giving uh, clients confidence and knowing how to crunch the numbers as well. What do we charge? We work on a fixed fee basis. Uh, it's between one and a half to 2%, depending on the type of service that you've chosen. Um, and, and the brief. Uh, we charge an engagement fee of between $3,000 for a property under a million dollars. For a property over a million, we charge $5,000 as an engagement. And again, if you're buying in your self-managed super fund, the good news is all of these fees are fully tax deductible as well. Um, so I want to get into some, uh, some case studies right now. Um, so let's have a look at a couple here that we've recently bought. Um, we buying, we really like in different areas for different reasons. This one's in Western Sydney that's going to benefit from Badgerys Creek Second Airport. This is a dual income property that we secured at auction uh, in May. Uh, we got it for um, one, just over one three. House rents for 800 and the granny flat rents for 500 a week. So a $1,300 return. So just very close to a 5% overall, but already established, uh, becoming very, very popular, that kind of property. Um, this is one we bought in Victoria, in Melbourne. Um, Amanda got this one near the Frankston High School Zone, very sought after area. Um, again, walked to the Bayside Beach areas, really lovely location. But what was the kicker on this particular property? It's got like a little uh, self-contained accommodation area that you could rent out separately, or you could just Airbnb it or have an extended family member there as well. Um, now it's got a lower, it doesn't, it's obviously not a positive cash flow property, but the capital growth rate will be very, very strong in that location. Uh, one we've just exchanged for literally a couple of weeks ago in um, Newcastle, and again, a dual living property built in flat uh, or the house. Uh, we got this for 1340, but our appraisal was 1.45. So we actually saved our clients over a hundred thousand. And the reason that Kevin and our team was able to do this was he was able to move really quickly. He knew the agent, knew the motivation of the vendor, was able to position his negotiating strength so that he was able to execute contract quickly, get the pest and build done and offer an unconditional contract. Um, really good buy, uh, it's in Lambton, really good, sorry, Adamstown Heights. So in a really great location. Um, we're doing a lot of buying in Brisbane as well at the moment. Um, this was one that we bought in uh, Springfield Lakes area, um, really good, really good offer. We actually managed to buy this property for eight ninety five, which was forty thousand dollars below another offer. Um, and the reason the vendor decided to go with us or with our particular buyer was simply because we were able to offer an unconditional finance clause. 
So we make sure that our clients have finance approved, cash deposit ready. And so the vendor wanted certainty. They didn't necessarily want more money, they just wanted certainty. So we're able to get that. Um, now this particular area has really, really jumped up. We've seen you know, really significant growth, probably by now it's over 25%, um, but a gross yield very close to 6% on the existing property. Another cracker we got on the Gold Coast. Um, I'm not generally a big fan of holiday apartments, but this one, I'd be very happy to have this one in my self-managed super fund, Natalia. Um, this was a two bedroom unit, um, not far from Service Paradise on the Gold Coast. Um, again, we got it off market through our connections. Um, it rents, uh, we got it for $6.55, all fully furnished. Um, it rents for $14.95 per week. Um, so we were estimating a gross yield of 11.8%. We actually were getting 13.9%. So the net yield, um, it's better than a lot of commercial properties. Um, it's actually netting close, just over 9%. So absolute cracking property um, in a high demand area. Um, this is a great strategy that I've done. This is actually one of my properties that I bought back in the year 2008. Um, great year to buy a property during the GFC. Um, had a granny flat at the back. We did a reno. We converted a three-bedroom house into a four-bedroom house, and then the, we renovated the granny flat. Um, its value today is probably actually about 2.6. I haven't updated the slide, um, and we're actually getting around about 17, sorry, about 17.90 a week, another 100 bucks a week. But just a great buy and hold property. Um, again, dual income really works well. And I recently did a similar thing up on the Central Coast as well. I bought a property last year for $9.50 up there at your minor beach. Um, had a big block. It was 750 square metre block. And the good thing about this one, we used a particular granny flat company that was able to get a three bedroom granny flat, 93 square metres. Now you might be thinking, gosh, Rich, that's impossible. It should be 60 mm -hmm. square metres, right? Um, but the cool thing about this is with complying development, they only assess the area uh, under, under roof. Um, so the garage and the patio areas are not included in the 60 square metres. The other trick is, um, I'll just show you the floor plan here. Let me just go to the floor plan. You see here the garage, uh, we converted that into a bedroom. So we added another second, uh, second ensuite and it's called dog grooming, apparently. That's the way you get it through council. It's called dog grooming. So there's a little tip for you. 96.6 um, square metres under roof. So, And we just rented that for 590 per week. So not a bad return. Um, so yeah, what's the numbers? So we ended up spending 1.18. Uh, we're getting 13.85 a week. Um, and the other kicker is we've made money um, just simply through equity uplift as well, about 120 grand. So yeah, great strategy um, that we really like. All right, another one uh, in Melbourne we bought for a client back in 2007. Um, actually, we haven't, I thought I updated this. This now rents for 1,200 a week. Uh, the rents have gone up there. And again, just a good long-term buy and hold. So again, holding this sort of property in your self-managed super fund would make a lot of sense if you were to, uh, to you know, think about selling it or even just getting good cash flow down the track. I want to introduce a concept also of rooming houses. This is a strategy we're adopting in Brisbane um, for selected clients that have got capacity. Um, this is where we find an existing block of land and we use a particular builder that can build a five bedroom rooming house. And what it is, it's not a boarding house, it's a rooming house. So different rules apply, much easier rules. So each room has got a bedroom, as you can see, uh, and each, each room has got its own little kitchenette and bathroom and living space. And then there's a common area and a common kitchen as you walk in as well. And one of the rooms generally toward the front of the house has slightly wider doorways to allow for uh, disabled access and that sort of thing as well. Now, the kicker on these things is the rent returns. We're typically getting uh, eight and a half to 9% gross yields and around six and a half to 6% net yields. So it does cost more. You have a property manager that rents out each individual room somewhere between $350 to $400 a week. Um, but these get snapped up in a heartbeat very, very quickly because uh, they're so popular. Mm. Um, one we bought on the Northern Beaches, again, a million dollar property, uh, saved our client 50 grand, uh, rents for 800 a week, gross, gross yield around just over 4%. Um, but yeah, great location, walk to beach, really close to all amenities. 
again, that'll be a great one for a, a super fund. Um, another one we just bought out in Western Sydney, Bosley Park. Um, again, saved our clients around 110K. Um, again, close to shopping centres and it had a house and an existing flat. So again, getting that 5% yield, which we used to get around you know 8 or 9% about 15 years ago, Natalia, but uh, obviously getting 5% in Sydney is, is a good achievement these days. Mm. Um, in Queensland, it's quite easy to get that sort of that sort of yield. Um, again, that one there, some lot cheaper properties around the 550 mark. I'll just skip through a couple of these. Um, that's another one we got off market. This one we got below market, um, 660 and rents for 680 a week, um, and that's gone up significantly. We've seen rental growth of 30%, capital growth of, of uh, 20 uh, over 22%. Um, miss that one. I'll just skip a few here. Got lots of examples in Brisbane. Um, actually, that one's incorrect. That should say uh, that's one in Melbourne that we've just bought. Um, we bought that nice unit in Melbourne there for six hundred and eighteen thousand, just near Albert Park, um, you know, not far from the CBD of Melbourne. Really nice building, great architecture. Um, we thought it would go for about 700, to be honest with you. And it was just one of those little buys for an apartment that was an absolute cracker. Um, there were expats returning from Austria and um, we were able to secure that, again, through our connections um, with, the, with the local agents. So, yeah, Melbourne has some really good opportunities as well. Also in the commercial space, uh, mentioned Alberto, who's our principal guy, is, is getting some awesome deals for our clients. Um, this client had a budget up to 1.8. And we purchased a nice strata unit uh, not far from the airport, five plus five year lease with 4% increases and net yield 6.4%. So really good buy. Um, also for another client that was a bit nervous about buying their first commercial property, spending, especially when they're spending $4 million on it. Uh, but this was a high net worth client that had bought a number of residential. I think he had about 10 or 15 properties. And he, I said to him, look, you might want to consider a couple of commercial. And he was very nervous Anyway, um, Alberto managed to negotiate a, a new seven plus seven year lease from an international company. And um, about three months after he bought this property, another strata unit in the same complex just sold for about 20% more. So he's already got a built in capital gain. Mm. Um, I'll skip that one. I'm going to jump off now, Natalia. And look, if you do have further questions, I'm sure there's a bunch of questions there. Um, do get in touch with us uh, myself. We're happy to answer those questions and, and go further. But we've got, oh, wow, there's lots and lots of questions. Let's get stuck into it, Natalia. Let's try and get through as many as okay. we can. Yeah, let's do that. So my plan is to purchase factory warehouse unit in SMSF uh, in the ballpark purchase price for this property, $1 million. Um, How much capital would be required? So basically, when you're talking about borrowing, it's uh, LVI is up to 80%. Uh, no, the, uh, there are there is one or two lenders which we do up to 90%. But basically, I'm not looking at mortgage broker, but this is what I've seen with my clients. Yeah, say 20%, you need to have a deposit. Um, all right. So next one is, uh, if we buy property in SMSF and not borrowing, do you need a custodian? Do, I, do we need a custodian by trust? No, you don't need, uh, Graham, you don't need the custodian trust. You just buy with the uh, SMSF cash, put it under SMSF name, SMSF name goes on the title, let's say. Uh, can you build an investment property in SMSF house and land? Again, if you have uh, cash, you can just, you know, like do it with cash, no problem. But if you have to borrow, then there is an issue because you need to find a one contract um, uh, one contract builder. So where you can have, uh, uh, it has to be single acquirable assets. So the bank will lend you. So you need to find an offer or builder who can do one contract. So, so it needs to be a single contract for single. house and land yeah, together yeah. rather than separately is the answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. Can the lender go after trustees' personal assets? Uh, no, if SMSF defaults. No, this is what I'm saying. It's a limited recourse. If you fail your repayments, only this property can be taken um, by the bank. Are you saying that SMSF pays off the loan, the property goes to... Uh, yes, whatever, whatever SMSF, whatever income 
uh, uh, has to go back to SMSF bank account. Whatever income is for SMSF assets, whatever is expensive, it's expenses you pay for SMSF assets, it actually has to be paid from SMSF bank account. So all the income goes back to SMSF, all the expenses are paid from SMSF. It's completely separate, like I said, entity, um, and you have to keep all the income and expenses separately. Are you saying that once SMSF pays off the loan fully, then property goes to SMSF? Uh, it depends. You, yes, you can transfer the property back to SMSF, or, um, or property can stay in a bad trust. doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be transferred back to SMSF. So usually people will do it, so they don't pay um, ASIC fees because a bear trust still have PTY LTD as a trustee for bear trust, and you'll be paying uh, ASIC fees of 200 something every year. And is, is there any transfer duty in transferring out of the bear No, trust? no, the only thing is if it's done properly, again, if it's done technically properly, there is no stamp, stamp duty. Uh, however, you will incur some um, solicitor's fees, of course, for this transfer. I don't know how much, but you know, a couple of grand. 1500 can you purchase an existing second hand property if it's uh, on a single contract yes, yes of, course. of course yeah yeah so is it possible to purchase a property outside of smsf in a unit trust and my smsf purchase those units all the time yeah there, with unit trust there are uh, options you, you basically yeah you need to um, you need to provide advice for structuring purchasing a unit trust but yeah it could be done so SMSF can buy units in the unit trust, but there are limitations there. What type of unit trust, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, if buying a new property, I have heard uh, a house and land purchase can only be as we, one. We've already answered this yeah, one. Yes, yes, the same, yes. yes. It's got to be uh, the same. Once the beneficiaries of member SMSF reach, say, 65, pension stage, um, again, if you want to live in the property, you have to transfer it out of SMSF. You cannot live in the property while it's in SMSF. Can you do? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if my husband can retire 10 years earlier than me and I will continue working, would SMSF will be available uh, to 0% tax? It will be calculated based on the uh, percentage of his balance. However, uh, if your husband retires and he's got 40%, his balance is 40%, then approximately 40% will be uh, taxed at zero. And uh, the rest, whatever your balance percentage is, will be taxed at um, normal 15 or 10%. So it's calculated with, uh, we use the actuarial certificate to calculate the tax, ex it's called tax exempt. Um, but it's all proportion, it's all calculated. Yeah, it's all maths basically. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, a few points from lending perspective. Um, so we are talking about offset account. It's, uh, it's a comment from Aaron, who's one of our referral partners, just talking about refinances and offset yeah. accounts as a, as a good way to have cash buffers stored that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Aaron. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. What is the maximum annual contributions? Okay, we, we, we are going into um, advice. The maximum uh, depends, you know, but my, my, there are caps, 27,500 per person per year of concessional or 110,000 uh, of non-concessional. Again, if you want more information, book, uh, book a session with me. But again, I can't provide advice in your particular circumstances. Can I just add one more top to point there that if you are selling a business uh, yeah. or potentially a down, what about downsizers? Um, selling their family home as well. They can put in 300K each, I believe. Hmm. Yeah, there are there are contribution types such as a business sale or uh, downsizes when they sell a property when, which they live for 10 years, at least 10 years. So yeah, but again, it's a separate topic. If you have, uh, if your circumstances are similar to like you're downsizing or you're selling the business, then again, if you book a meeting, we can go into the details. Um, so uh, minimum legal amount to start as MSF. There is no minimum legal amount. Uh, however, the, the, the common sense is around 150,000 because otherwise it's not um, cost, cost effective. You're paying too much fees. And plus uh, the banks will not lend you the money if you have less than I think 140 or 115 as MSF. So basically you, you are limited. You are limited and you're paying high fees. Uh, Robert is very interesting, very good. Book the meetings, uh, meeting with me, with Rich. 
Can you explain a little of asset protection provided by SMSF? So um, legal claims. Okay, because the SMSF, which is why this is one of the reasons we recommend to set up a SMSF with a corporate trustee. So what it, a corporate trustee gives a better protection of assets from the creditors because uh, SMSF assets uh are protected, any superannuation assets are protected, protected from the creditors. So if you go bankrupt, your creditors cannot touch superannuation. But the assets have to have this name, legal SMSF name, on a title, on a bank account, on a, any uh, like share, share account, so to be protected. It's very important, yeah, but it's protected. So creditors, uh, your creditors cannot go after SMSF assets. Um, Property development, the yeah, answer is property no, development. You, you, you can't can... do property development unless you're doing it entirely in cash in a super fund. Yeah, there are like a couple of other options, but even if you think about borrowing, no, you can't do the property development and borrow money. Uh, it will be breach of CIS Act. Um, does the CMSF establishment package include the cost of setting up the bear trust? No, the cost of setting up a bear trust is another three thousand dollars. So, um, yeah, because it's a separate entity with another uh, PTY LTD, with another company. So, so all together, it's a 10 grand to set up a SMSF and to set up a bear trust to buy a property. What happens to the property when they pass away? Uh, do they go to children? All right. Uh, this is the retirement planning. There are ways of... Um, basically passing this money to and your uh, assets to your children. However, it's a complicated topic. Again, you need to book a meeting. I can't tell you in one sort of like sentence what will happen. But yes, there are ways how to make sure your money goes to whoever you want them, your money to go to. Is there yeah. a way? This is a good question about leveraging. So if you buy a property in a self-managed super fund, Natalia, can you leverage that like you do with property outside? To buy a second one no no unfortunately it's only one one of things so you can borrow against this particular property and you can refinance this property but that's it you cannot unfortunately leverage and um cross collaterate the properties in smsf so yeah unfortunately um do i need more than one bank account to invest the cash i have you can have as many bank accounts as you want as long as they are under SMSF name, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. We'll send out the link um, yeah. in the email after this. We'll send both the recording and all of the notes and the slides yeah. to every everyone who's registered. Yeah. Does property in SMSF contribute to outside performance? No. Uh, they all the assets to in SMSF. Uh, again, all the expenses will be paid by SMSF, and they will be assessed as SMSF assets. Um, I can answer this one, Natalia. Um, <laughs> buying a property uh, with a granny flat, mm. you can buy the property with, with limited recourse borrowing, but the granny flat, you have to use the cash that's within the self-managed super fund to build that. So you can't borrow to build the granny flat. Yep. Can kids be added to a SMSF trust? Yes, they can. Um, what age? Sorry, yeah, they have to be 18 because they have to become a director uh, mm -hmm. directors of the corporate trustee, so they have to be 18. Uh, but you have to think about the investment strategy. They might think about investing in more riskier assets uh, than you. So, you, yeah, you you have to think it, if it will work between you and your kids. Can I have more than one commercial property in my SMSF uh, if I already have a limited record? You can have as many limited records borrowing arrangements as you want. If you have a deposit for another property, you have you can buy another property. The only thing you have to do in another bear trust, you can have the same corporate trustee as for the first bear trust, but you have to set up another bear trust. One bear, bear trust per property. So each property has to have its own bear trust. But yeah, you can if you have... Um, so maybe just one point to make there on that too, um, Natalia, is about caps. Um, the government introduced a $3 million cap um, if it's yeah. if it's two partners, husband and wife or partners, then it's obviously six million. So yeah. the number of properties, we just got to work out that you're not going to exceed the threshold and then pay excessive tax over the threshold. Yeah, but then they think about about the tax. You still pay thirty percent tax. You still pay. I mean, if this will come in place, this new legislation, yeah. if you're over three million, 
you still have 30% tax. It's probably less than, well, if person has 3 million in SMSF, they probably pay 45% tax outside of super. This yeah. is what, you know, my thoughts are. But um, yeah, if, if you are uh, over 3 mil, the tax will be different. Mm -hmm. um, most likely, most likely it will come into place again. Mm -hmm. Uh, how can I put more cash in my SMSF legally? Again, contributions, we have to, um, you have to book an appointment and we talk about contributions. Uh, without Next providing... one here, um, for Yvonne, yeah, Yvonne, I'll send you our fee schedule. It's a fixed fee schedule and you'll see how it's all uh, laid out there. So a property at a million dollars would be 2%. So it's approximately mm -hmm. the 20,000. Um, I think it's 19,900, including GST. And then there's a scaled fee for up from there um and down to about 1.65 but i'll send you the full full details yeah is capital growth or positive cash flow main evaluation correct Ooh, i think that one i'd say natalia is is uh, very much a advice question it's going to depend on the person's requirements and their age so as mm -hmm. an example again not giving advice but if they're a younger person um, and their income is going to grow you want to get good growth assets into the self-managed super fund and build up the capital and as you're approaching retirement, cash flow is going to become even more important for you. So, but it also depends on your income because you don't want to be buying a property as super fund and then having to fork out oodles and oodles of extra dollars that you don't have to support that investment. So again, it's a very much uh, a, yeah. a personal criteria question that you need to look at. Yeah, talk to Rich, you know, talk to advisor and um, figure out together. Small amount of money, can you still help to purchase the investment property? Small amount, I don't know, it depends. So like I said, if it's less than 140, you probably will not find a bank which will lend you or lender. It's not, it's actually second tier lenders. So yeah, you have to talk to the mortgage broker. But if it's uh, less than 140, um, yeah, it's it probably doesn't make sense uh, to do it now. Uh, at, at this stage, I mean, which banks are offering a home loans for SMSS? Uh, again, I'm not a mortgage broker, but what I've seen that uh, not not a big four uh, second tier lenders we are talking about. So it's more um, to the mortgage broker, I guess. Uh, question. The same for the next one as well. Yeah. yeah. What's the next? One? Anything stopping me buying and selling every two years with ten percent capital gains? If I can, I still buy the self managed super fund with lending after retirement age and continue my strategy. Yeah, you can yeah, buy and sell, yeah. whatever, you know, like yeah. no one's stopping you to do it. It's just like you have to be very good at, at the picking this type of properties where you pay the stamp duty and all the expenses and still make money in two years, right, uh, Rich? So mm -hmm. like, yeah, but why not? In case of default, the bank can, can't go after individual uh, then why do they ask for a personal guarantee? Ah, uh, look, it's it's a good question because they still uh, want to make sure that um, someone is taking responsibility. But look, I'm not a bank. I don't know why they're asking after the personal guarantee um, because, yeah, they can't go after uh, anything else. Thanks, Rich. So, yeah. The rooming house one, uh, there is a way to do it. Um, again, it's got to be on a single contract. It will cost more, um, but it can cost anywhere from about 50 to 100K more to do that particular strategy um, we're doing. Mm. But it needs to be on a single contract, but it can be done. Mm. Okay. Is purchasing multiple properties? Yes, needs uh, to have every property, one property, one trust. So basically, yeah, multiple trusts. After I pay the setup fees, how much do I pay the year? Okay, uh, every year the compliance fees between three and $4,000. So it includes accounting, audit, ATO supervisory levy, ASIC fees. Yeah, so any of compliance fees. Um, yeah, how much tax do we need to pay on the CMSF property income? Uh, you pay 15% tax, like I said, 15% tax on the income. Um, 10% tax on the capital gain after 12 months uh, you hold the property for and zero tax once you retired, once you move to retirement phase. Uh, can, how many properties can you buy in one SMSF? As many as you as want. As many as possible. <laughs> yeah, as many as possible, exactly. Um, yeah, just think about that after 3 million. So uh, you probably will end up paying um 30 percent tax instead of zero percent tax because government doesn't want to um reach people to have the same uh, concessions which is zero tax as um as everyone else so they think three million and you already 
uh, in this bracket where you should pay more tax. This is the government opinion. Um, is it true that SMSF lending does not affect your personal borrowing capacity? Again, it's not a question uh, for me, it's a question for the mortgage broker, um, but it's not. The, the lenders, they look at, uh, at SMSF like a separate entity. Can SMSF purchase, say, 10 acre farm, farm, purchase a farm with a house on it? Uh, yeah, and then rent it to non-related party. Yes, you can. So definitely. Uh, because um, the house on it is it's, it's still going to be business real property because the house on it, it's all like small compared to 10 acres. It will be incidental sort of like uh, residential property, but on a business real property. So it won't affect the status of uh, being a business real property. So you can even rent it to yourself, to, I mean, to your business. Basically, SMSF investing mean I, C, D, my buy my future retirement home to live in after both parties have moved into retirement. Yeah, so basically you can buy the, the house, like I said, you can buy apartment, you can buy a residential property, rent it out, and when you retire, you have to move it out of its MSF, and then you can do whatever you want with it. Is it better to buy property in a SMSF or in a trust? Um, again, it depends. It really depends. You need to get the tax advice because family trust is, uh, my understanding you're talking about family trust, it's completely different story and different advantages and disadvantages. Can I take my super out of a defined benefit, uh, defined benefit pension to set up? Uh, most likely there are a lot of types of different defined benefit pensions, the government pension. Most uh, likely, no, most likely you can't, but yeah, you have to have a look at the statement and uh, and find out which kind of, what kind of defined benefit pension you've got, defined benefit account, sorry. Um, if you uh, downsize, uh, does it matter if you have granny flat income? Uh, I don't understand this question. I don't think so, I don't really get the question, but anyway. Yeah. Go to the next one. Eastern source, some detail. Stamp duty on 700. Sorry, it's, you know, like uh, you need to find a calculator. <laughs> um, yeah, there is a stamp duty. Of course, you have to pay stamp duty, but uh, it depends which state you're buying in, et cetera, et cetera. So just, yeah. Uh, does all uh, property income have to cover costs or can dividend income from other SMSF investment help? Um, no, it doesn't. Like Rich mentioned, you can buy even like negatively geared property. It's all about cash flow. If you have cash flow from other income like dividends, uh, distributions, uh, contributions, then it, it will cover it will cover the cost. So you just have to have a look and think if you if you want to have a negatively geared property or not in your SMSF. I think your other ones asking about rates. Um, you're going to be see, probably see a seven percent, but again, talk to a mortgage broker to get the rates. Yeah. Really super fun yeah. So seven percent, I think around seven, a yeah. little bit higher. Yeah. And, uh, uh, can you move existing investment property into a self managed super fund? My belief is yes, you can, but you're going to be paying transfer duty to do that, right? Um, no, it's sorry, it's not exactly the same. So if if it's business real property, you can buy from a related party from yourself. If it's a residential property, unfortunately, you can't. So you have to basically, um, yeah, you have to buy residential property from third party. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Can I pay mm -hmm. cash into SMSF and borrow this money to add a granny flat? Um, no, you cannot borrow uh, from SMSF. So uh, in terms of the uh, increase in the balance of, balance of SMSF, there are ways how to increase the balance and it's called contributions. There are different types of contributions, but with the borrowing, only one type of borrowing of, uh, is allowed. If SMSF borrows under uh, limited recourse borrowing arrangement, SMSF can borrow from related party, yes. Uh, however, the same arrangement has to be set up by a trust and it has to be at arm's length. So. Uh, exactly replicating the same conditions like uh, with the bank. So, yeah. Do you see the rules changing soon? Uh, seems so generous. Yeah, $3 million um, is coming, cap is coming where the um, whatever is income on the balance is above 3 million will be taxed at uh, 30%. But again, it's not the law yet, but it seems that it will become a law. Uh, 
I think from 2025. So at the moment, yeah, at the moment it's a paradise tax haven, whatever you call it. Can we ever combine concessional caps for the next three years? As I said, um, okay, with concessional caps, um, no, you don't combine the concessional caps. You ca can combine non-concessional caps for three years, but again, um, you just can contact me and we, I will explain you more. Just clarify a previous question. If you have a granny flat receiving income, I, if my own home has a granny flat receiving income and I want to sell the whole property, can I use the on-sizer option to do money in the CMSF? Again, we have to have a look. We have to have a look at your uh, this uh, particular circumstances for the on-sizer. We have to have a look at your age. We have to have a look how many years you lived in it. So we have to have a look at your uh, particular circumstances. Okay, reach for you. Uh, uh, last one. I think we need to I'll just wrap it up with this question. But someone's asking about Perth and Brisbane. Yes, those markets have been going very strong and are predicted, both Perth and Brisbane are predicted to grow very strongly. Mm -hmm. um, for my money, I'd be putting my money to Brisbane over Perth just at the moment, just because of um greater job diversification also the olympics coming in 2032 mm. um also very affordable and not as reliant on the commodities market um, but again where you decide to invest is uh is a, a broader question that we need to have a strategy chat for um guys we're going to have to leave it there can i just say thank you so much for joining us today um on the uh, property buyer webinar thank you natalia for your thank expert you. advice and ripping through those 65 questions or whatever <laughs> it was today uh, well done you're in the hot seat for sure yeah. um thank you again if you do have inquiries please reach out we'd love to help you on your property journey but we look forward to seeing you again very soon thank yeah. you thank you thank you everyone see you Thanks. thank you